Uh, you pretty much covered everything I wanted to say over here. So my name is Linda, I come from Helsinki. Uh, nowadays work and live in New York. Uh, here I'm, I'm here in Dublin as the digital champion of uh, Finland. And I wanted to tell you three stories. Uh, first, why code is poetry. Second, why code is literacy, uh, literature. And why all of this matters to Europe. I'm just going to get started why, on why I became interested in programming. Um, I'm 14 years old. I'm madly in love with Al Gore, uh, who is the then Vice President of the United States. Uh, I'm 14, uh, 13 years old, this is 2001, and I have no way of expressing all this energy and enthusiasm I have for him, except for making a website for him. And at the time we didn't have any fancy website making machines, and I needed to learn HTML and CSS uh, to make this happen. And this is probably the first and also the last Finnish website ever made for Al Gore. And uh, it's, it's not online anymore, happily. But what this experience taught me uh, was that uh, you can express yourself online. And I was, I was pretty good at HTML and CSS. And then for years and years and years, I just like fiddled around with them. But then I never made the jump into actual programming world. And I truly love Facebook and Tumblr and Pinterest and all these services that come up, but they are doing something really, really profoundly wrong for my generation of women. They are making us curators instead of creators. So we just re-blog stuff, we like things, we passively consume internet instead of being a part of creating the internet. I have friends who build really amazing companies and technology uh, solutions and, and web apps and so forth, but none of them are girls. I come from Finland, and I want to tell you three stories about Finland. So first of all, we have an amazing engineering culture. Uh, most of the backbone of the whole internet was built in Scandinavia with companies like MySQL, SSH, Linux, Git, IRC, uh, all by Finnish and Scandinavian engineers who wanted to build something for everyone, so they didn't make it for profit only. Second, we are one of the most equal countries in the world, so we have a woman as a president, uh, Finnish women in general are really, like, there's no glass ceilings over where I come from. And third of all, we have a track record of being able to make societal change. So in a hundred years, we went from being a very poor country into being one of the most livable countries in the world. And yet we face the exact same problem as everyone else. We have no women building the internet. And this is something I set out to change in 2010 uh, when we organized the first uh, Rails Girls event. And Rails Girls is a two-day event uh, for total beginners in coding, giving them the first experience in software craftsmanship, showing them how web applications are built from concept to actual code. And uh, the first event was done because I wanted to teach myself coding. So this was like for my 25 friends in Helsinki and a few uh, other friends who knew how to program. And we made a really fun experience where uh, we wanted to show that coding is not mathematical, coding is not lonely, it's not like for introverted people, it's, it's social and whatever profession you have in life, you are going to benefit from knowing the basics of code. Turns out, a lot of other people want to be doing this too. So to date, I think Rails Girls has been in over 90 countries, ranging from cities like Belo Horizonte in Brazil, to Berlin, to Tokyo, to uh, we had one in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania just recently. And I think why this happens is, again, the free finished things we had. So the culture of open source. Instead of trying to make this into a business where people would pay for us for licenses or anything like that, we just open source everything. We put every single thing you need to organize an event online. So there's the instructions on how to get local coaches. There's instructions on how to get sponsors. There's instructions for every single thing you can think of, like posters, uh, balloons, uh, quirky little name tags. Uh, they are all found over there. Uh, the second thing, understanding engineering culture. So all Rails Girls events are grassroots uh, organization events. They are done by local developers who uh, all of us probably think are really like weird and introverted and don't want to be helping out uh, bring more women uh, into technology. Turns out they do want to do that. We've never ever had problems when we ask, go to a city and ask, hey, would you help install... Uh, Ruby on Rails for 100 girls this Friday and help coach them the next day. The boys and girls are always ecstatic about this and Rails Girls has spread in less than two years in over 90 cities just because people want to be doing a change. And that's the whole uh, third point about where this Finnish heritage shows in the Rails Girls movement is 
is the uh, like pace of change we're able to show. So we have a community of around, I'd say, a thousand people at least who are actively involved in organizing these things. Uh, it's really cool to see Croatian uh, coaches go into Berlin to teach others and have people all around, like Tokyo girls helping out Brazilian boys to teach rails for these girls. And, and it's a very lively and organic community that helps one another. And the pace of change is so fast that uh, reporters sometimes ask that, uh, okay, so what is, like, is there a Pinterest already built uh, from a rails girls participant? Not yet, but the mindsets are already there. And this uh, movement has reached so many people that even though they wouldn't become coders in one day, they at least have the fun foundations and fundamentals and uh, they know other people in their local community who know how to go. Uh, the last initiative uh, that I wanted to talk about in Rail Schools uh, is Rail Schools Summer of Code. So we see all these enthusiastic girls come into an event and during one weekend shop they code something, they deploy something, they see their uh, stuff live, but we never get them to be a part of the overall uh, like open source community. So this was an initiative. Uh, I, I wasn't even a part of this that much. Uh, I just like oversaw that things went well. This was a bunch of really amazing volunteers from Berlin who put together a campaign uh, to get beginner girls who just completed their first Rails Girls event, who maybe continued for a few weeks on coding. Uh, they put together a campaign to get them to work for a whole summer paid on open source projects that power this whole um, coding movement. So Ruby on Rails is a programming language that uh, powers stuff like Twitter, uh, or used to power Twitter. Uh, uh, Groupon, I think, uses it. So many, like millions and millions of companies use this programming language. And the basic building blocks of this are built by volunteers, uh, open source uh, maintainers and committers. And now these girls, uh, 10 of them, will be able to uh, use the whole summer to be a part of building this, like from grounds up, this whole programming language. And they come from all over the world, from India to Argentina to Poland to, uh, I think, no Irish representatives, also no Finnish representatives, so that shows how, how global the movement has begun. And it was less than 10 days that like, this whole 80,000 uh, euros was collected. And all, like, no formal organization behind this, no formal, nobody got paid to do this. It was all the grassroots enthusiasm and people wanting to help. Um, maybe we can like. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, thanks a million. That's a, that's a wonderful background to that. It, it set me up. You answered a couple of our questions already okay. there. But one thing that's interesting, and we were just chatting about it there before, is um, things like Coda Dojo, uh, which is sort yep. of our own homegrown. And maybe that's why you had no Irish people there. Mm -hmm. too busy yeah. <laughs> But um, actually, Una Fox is here, who's the co-founder of the LA Code of I mentioned it to you there. Um, and it has kind of gone international as well. A lot of the kids there are very, very young. Mm -hmm. in, in Rails Girls, is there a sort of a, a typical age group? Or where do you start? Or how young do you think people should start? I think Rails Girls was, again, intended for... Like, I was 23 when I started Rails Girls, so, and hence the name also, which gets us a lot of... Uh, I'm not a native English speaker, so... Uh, I didn't know that there's like a connotation with the world girls that is negative to a certain age group or like certain uh, yeah uh, amount of people. What we usually see is people ranging from 16 to over 60. And uh, could I change things again? I would probably think about the name again because uh, again, girls gives you the idea that it's it's younger girls. But 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 yeah. Uh, and I, I was talking to you, you were quoting Steve Jobs there, I, I was I had the privilege of meeting Steve Woz, he's co-founder of mm -hmm. Apple, and he's big into programming and getting kids programming as well, and he's well aware of your organisation, and he was saying that he thought that you should get kids from like sort of the age of 10, and then the real programming can only be done after the age of 11 or 12. I could, I could show but, my next project, so, so that yeah. kind of touches on that, so code is literacy, and, and how code is the most important language of the 21st century, so... The reason I, I think this is important as a, as a subject is because code is the fastest way to change a society at the moment. Not legislation, not policy making, it's code. And companies like Amazon and Spotify and Facebook are changing our, like, how we see friendship, how we see money, how we see knowledge, how we see, see books so fast and so rapidly that uh, it's, it's just like mind-blowing, but then also really scary because it's a very, very narrow group of guys in their like 20s, white or Asian, who are driving all of this change. And that's why we should all be able to code. Not because uh, coding per se would be so important, but it's because it's the tool of the 21st century to change stuff. And also because it's really amazing to see something come out of nothing that you can build. And 
uh, one of my friends said that if uh, like the three most important languages of the future are JavaScript, I uh, know English, Chinese, and JavaScript, and that's how important coding is. But I think that uh, I, I totally agree with this statement. But in addition to saying that, I think if JavaScript is the new lingua franca of our generation, it's not only enough that we learn the grammar and the basics and like repeat. Uh, stuff over and over, we should also learn to write poetry with that language. And that's where I think the age comes in, that if we teach women my age to write for loops, it's a little bit too late, it should start much earlier. And my sort of project uh, that I've been working on uh, on the side has been a children's book uh, project that teaches you sort of the philosophical backgrounds of coding, not per se like the arithmetic stuff that happens, but sort of the mindset and thinking that happens in coding and it's, uh, it's this story of a little girl called Ruby and she travels all around the world and she meets these amazing, amazing uh, figures uh, like the androids that are really... I think really... she was Irish. Pardon me? I think she was yeah. Irish. Yeah, <laughs> I think she's, she's Danish, Japanese, Finnish probably. <laughs> uh, she's, uh, she's really opinionated and quirky and, and strong little girl. And she meets all these characters like the androids who are really chatty, a little bit messy. She can't really, because they are all yelling at the same time and, and they want to be doing all these different things. And she meets the snow leopard who's beautiful and wants to be alone and doesn't want to like play with the other kids. And she meets uh, Tux the penguin who speaks in a weird language and she knows that, oh, this guy is really smart, but I don't really understand what he's saying. And Firefox, who just wants to throw parties and stuff like that. So <laughs> this book teaches, uh, teaches the kids about sort of the stuff that happens behind the code, like how these companies are different from one another, how, how profoundly they are changing our culture and society at the moment. Long answer. <laughs> no, very interesting. And you're currently community manager with Code Academy. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, I know I've heard it, Code Academy say things like that education is broken. You yep. know, it kind of refers back to this again. And I know, for example, the founders of Code Dojo, their philosophy is that it's almost better if it's outside the formal education mm -hmm. process. What, what are your thoughts on that? You know, these kind of coding movements, is it better that they be outside schools or should schools be teaching coding? I think schools should be teaching coding. I, I think coding should be like... Uh, should be across. It shouldn't be its own little domain where you learn ICT skills, you learn Microsoft Office, uh, but it should be applied across curriculum. So when you're doing knitting lessons or craft lessons, you're actually learning sequential thinking. And when you're learning philosophy, Bernard Russell's like logic is the basis of all programming languages. Uh, when you're learning philosophy, you're like essentially learning code. When you're when you're learning French, you're learning a new language, and that same like learning mechanism can be applied to JavaScript or Python or Ruby. And definitely, it should be taught in schools. And you mentioned an example to me earlier. Is that is it Estonia? Yes, Estonia. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit? About so that? I think Europe has a really cool advantage of having a lot of small nations that can turn fast. So US education system, that's why I think our founders talk about uh, education system needing to be like outrun because it's so slow to change and move. But European countries can drive fast change. And Estonia is doing an amazing initiative where they are teaching all of their, like a whole generation of seven-year-olds next fall are going to start with coding. Like every single kid in Estonia is going to learn code. Iceland is doing something similar. Netherlands is doing something similar. There's a lot of like stuff happening in Europe in the education mm -hmm. scene. I think French people are. You should talk with Gilles Babinet, who's going to be here tomorrow morning. Tomorrow he can he can tell what fr French people are working on. Very good. And just you know, and you've touched on it a few times there, but as regards sort of that entrepreneurship that we need, the kind of startup. Um, environment that we need in Europe uh, mm -hmm. you know when you're coming back and forth how does it compare to the Silicon Valley <laughs> New York etc here yeah. in the likes of Dublin Berlin yeah. Helsinki I, I think this <laughs> goes nicely <laughs> so, uh, Europe this is the scary figure so this is a McKinsey study 250,000 new jobs needed to be created in Finland only to like um, level out the deficit, like the budget deficit of, like no new jobs created per se, just to level out things in the next 10 years. And 250,000 jobs is like a huge amount of jobs. And then another like nugget of information, I think this is from the Kaufman Foundation, and they say that almost all new, new jobs are created in companies less than five year old. And this doesn't mean that companies like Nokia wouldn't employ people in the future, but it means that companies like Nokia won't be creating new jobs and we need 250,000 new jobs just to level out things. And this is, I think, where the entrepreneurship 
uh, thing comes to life. And I've had the privilege of being able to work both in Silicon Valley. I used to run a program for all the university and Stanford University and now be in New York. And I absolutely adore the way Americans do things. But I think <laughs> we still have a lot of uh, our own competitive strengths. And I think somehow... I, I don't think the biggest human endeavors can be private. I think there's a lot of like culture and compassion and history and depth of thinking in Europe that we we are we're going to be able to build really amazing companies as long as we learn from the Americans and we like take all that stuff. We teach our whole continent to code and then we just run <laughs> faster than everyone else. And like I don't want 25 year old Californian kids deciding what my friendship should look like. No like no offense, they are doing a wonderful job over there. But I think it's a sad thing if my generation's biggest problems are like ad clicks and stuff like that. It should be something bigger and I think Europeans in like traditionally have been good at thinking big things. Yeah. And I mean you know at a policy level are there things that governments should be doing? I mean obviously the the coding element and the education mm-hmm. element, I mean are there more things they could be doing to to encourage young people to be creative and think, as you discussed there, think poetically and creatively and think of making things rather than being consumers of Facebook. Mm-hmm. <laughs> for I think it's good to leave Europe, to be honest. Like Everyone asks me, how can you be the digital champion of Finland and live in New York? And I think it totally makes sense, first of all, because uh, that's the way you learn, by going mm-hmm. to places and meeting people who think not like you. And I hope that one day I'll be able to spend some time in Shanghai, in Tokyo, everywhere, and bring all of that back to Europe. <laughs> so that's my, that would be my first like, uh, suggestion for European young people to like, leave Europe for a while and then come back and then appreciate all the quality of life and the things we do so well over here. And the policy level things, in all honesty, that's why I'm here. Like, I, I know nothing about policy level changes, and, and that's why it's such a privilege to be working with people who have made their whole career in this world and, and learning from them. And tell us a little bit, uh, the time I want to make sure other people have time, um, just tell us a little bit about Finland, you know, and your, your role as digital champion yeah. and what Finland is doing to, to compete in this new landscape. I think Finland is in a really interesting uh, position now because we... Uh, so everyone has heard the story of Nokia, where like our triumphant, uh, like our whole society was geared towards Nokia. Our university uh, made people for Nokia. Like when I started business school, every single kid wanted to go work for Nokia, and and that's great. Uh, but I think it's good actually that Nokia is doing so well now because that has forced us to come up with other creative solutions. And one sector that has been doing really well after the Nokia decline has been gaming. And we've had Rovio, which is the uh, maker of Angry Birds. Finnish people normally say that we are not salespeople, we are not good at marketing, but Rovio has totally like turned that over. They are amazing at marketing, they're amazing at logistics. And then there's another company called Supercell uh, that does t- tablet gaming, and they are making $2.3 million a day, I think, at the moment. Uh, they are less than two years old as a company, and they employ 80 people. And they are just doing like world class things in a very contained small space. And we are, we have this like ecosystem of gaming companies now that uh, like just help each other out and, and, and do world class things within Helsinki. And the most important thing that they do is that they employ people from all over the world. So Supercell, I, I think, I don't remember the exact numbers, I think they have like 70 employees and, and 50 nationalities or something like that. So that's really good. And that's what Helsinki needs, like more. <laughs> not a policy level <laughs> opinion but my personal opinion I think we just like that's the beauty of New York is that everyone from everywhere in the world comes over there yeah. and that's what Helsinki needs too very good